Um, staking claims and taking place uh, is an exercise in acoustic ecology that demonstrates how sounding support, so that's being a supporter uh, and performing football fandom uh, is a political act in Ottawa today. Uh, to argue that point, I use data I gathered from ethnographic field work and some audio recordings uh, I made while inside the, seat, the city's TD Place Stadium uh, between 2014 and 2016. Uh, I bring that information into conversation with the Bach team's dialogic imagination and, and concept of voice. Uh, and frame football fandom as a performance in the way that Bauman and later Bauman and Briggs conceived of it. So Mikhail Bakhtin, literary critic, theorist, and philosopher, hears voices in everything and dialogic relations among them. Uh, Richard Bauman and Charles Briggs, working in linguistic anthropology and folklore, took those voices uh, out of the book, off the written page, uh, and made the claim that situated conduct um, is a social text and readable too. Uh, one last thing, uh, before I begin the argument, I'm hoping to stimulate some discussion about the ethnographic methods um, used to capture sonic data. Uh, I need something more effectively representative than, than this. <laughs> today. Um, <laughs> what you just heard was a snippet of a song that some of the supporters in Ottawa like to sing. So Fury, that's the name of the team, We Are Always With You, over a melody borrowed from East Coast Canadian Joel Plaskett's 2006 song, Nowhere With You. Um, I wish I had something of, of higher fidelity, uh, but I was not allowed to bring a, a condenser microphone into the stadium. Uh, they actually search bags and jackets uh, make you empty your water bottle uh, before you walk in. You can see security, uh, maybe not so well, but it's in the yellow there by the white tent. Um, so imagine the kerfuffle when I, I tried to get inside with a shoulder bag that had in it a, a water bottle, uh, a notebook with a doodle of a stadium, uh, a battery-operated <laughs> recording device, uh, a microphone, and then a loop of cable uh, needed to connect the whole thing. Uh, they sent me home. Um, but uh, let us go forward into the politics of sounding football fandom in this social setting. July 19, 2014, the Ottawa Fury FC played their first game inside the freshly renovated, reconstructed TD Place Stadium uh, in Ottawa, Ontario, the capital of my country, that's Canada, located on the border between Ontario and Quebec, two very different provinces. Uh, the 24,000 seat open air multi-use facility was upgraded as part of a $300 million renovation project that went to reestablish Lansdowne Park, so where it is located, this whole, this whole area, uh, Lansdowne Park, uh, as the premier site of leisure and entertainment in the city. Uh, along with new restaurants, shops, and a green space, uh, the renovated stadium reopened the urban site as a, a host for professional football. Uh, people were very excited. Uh, ad campaigns took over billboards through the city all the way into the suburbs, and posters lined the streets. They said, pro soccer is here. Uh, see it right there. I think, I think that's worth at least two minutes. Uh, in Ottawa, saying the word football in an English-speaking Canadian's accent, with the implication that you were talking about the beautiful game, is a political act. Uh, Canada Soccer is the name of the governing body for sport in the country. Uh, in Ottawa, the unqualified football looks like this, face masks, helmets, shoulder pads. Um, and in Ottawa, it actually sells out the new stadium. Um, the sound world is wildly different. Um, I won't go further into the discourse analysis. I just want to bring that imagination here for context. Um, in Ottawa today, even to complicate things further, um, the, the Canadian football team, the Ottawa Red Blacks, uh, and an association football club, the Ottawa Fury FC, who I'm talking about today, uh, share the same stadium, the same team colors, and some percentage of fan base. Um, though the Ottawa Fury Football Club brand themselves as such, um, uh, saying football without any qualification, when they advertise to the public, they use the word soccer. Um, but whatever we call it back home, uh, from here on out, I'll refer to the beautiful game as only football. Uh, I'm interested in analyzing its soundscape and, and what and how it means in, in Canada's capital, so I'll, I'll move forward. 
So in Ottawa, again, between 2014 and 2016, the average attendance at a football match hovered at around only 5,000 people. Uh, the newly unveiled and upgraded stadium was four-fifths empty consistently. Uh, in a crowd that size, maybe 50 people could be identified as a, as a supporter and, and done so because they all occupy kind of one section of the stadium. Uh, we call it Section W on the southwest side. Uh, they wear branded clothing of the team or of their supporters group, and they hold scarves, wave flags, and dance, and drum, and ch uh, sing, and chant, and, and play drums for the duration of the contest. Um, being a supporter of the Ottawa Fury FC in Ottawa, therefore, uh, is a fringe activity of a fringe sport where only a subsection of a subsection of the stadium comes alive in such a way. However, through negotiation and tact, the supporters groups uh, that were and still are active in the stadium convinced the owners and operators of the Ottawa Fury FC to not play popular music through the sound system during the games. Uh, the supporters wanted football to sound like it's supposed to, uh, like it does where it's taken seriously in other parts of the world. So you see, as a Canadian uh, born in 1985, uh, I'm used to hearing music at, at live sporting events, um, but maybe from a PA system or some paid local group, uh, maybe a marching band, um, but there's rarely, if never, an acoustic substrate supporting the sport, the teams, and their players while the game is being played. Now, here I mean acoustic is not electronically mediated. So in that way, uh, I've been in culture to expect music and sports to have a commercial nature. Uh, and to be mediated electronically. Um, I call this the sonic diktat of North American sport. Uh, the bombardment of top 40 hits, the announcer telling me to get loud while David Lee Roth sings, jump, and the jumbotron lights the way. Um, at a football game, however, the Ottawa Fury, there was no Van Halen coming out of the speakers. People were jumping because they wanted to, uh, not because some unseen master, the Akus Met, uh, told them to do so. Uh, in that way, this is resistance. So not all politics are state politics. So the supporters in Ottawa, however few there may be, are exposing other types of sports fans in Canada's capital, uh, the curious ones who want to see this fringe sport, to this well-established and well-known, but new here, sonic tradition. Uh, some of the supporters, while interviewed, uh, mentioned what they called the Ottawa box. Um, Ottawa is a diplomatic city. Uh, that goes to sleep early, and there's kind of a running joke that it's the city that fun forgot. Um, but being in a supporters group, this is true, you hear it all the time. Um, being in a supporters group is one way to temporarily escape that. Um, the traditional music culture popular to this global expanse of football fans affords its participants an interactive and highly participatory, highly improvised sounding experience. What emerges from the context is, is orally outrageous. Um, it seems like the banter is actually what a lot of the supporters come for. Um, so I hung around with uh, the supporters group, the Stony Monday Riot, uh, for two years, um, practicing their form of fandom and, and getting to know what motivated their action, uh, or, or what drew different members into this scene, um, how they went about their operations, so that on game day, um, they were ready to stake their claim, and take their place as supporters in the stadium. But the more I was around, the more I learned not everything is so happy-go-lucky and, and fun, fun, fun. Um, well, they successfully worked from the bottom up, uh, from the grassroots, to become key players in football's sonic fandom in Ottawa, really being what uh, Murray Schaefer, the Canadian composer, uh, would call football's sound mark. Uh, it became clear that not all was well in the grassroots. The Stony Monday Riot, the supporters who I thought represented the entire stadium in Section W, were not alone. Uh, they had competition from another, um, and from one that they used to be. So it was explained to me uh, by one research participant this way. So, quote, um, initially, a small group of people went to soccer games together in and around Ottawa to take part in supporters culture because not many people were doing it in the city. So he continued. There was an argument, a, a stupid argument, about how we represent ourselves in the stadium, and a lot of people felt, step away, step away, uh, we'll try to do something different. So four of them broke off and, <laughs> and formed the Stony Monday Riot, uh, named after an actual riot that took place uh, over two days in Ottawa in 1849. Uh, a political conflict where one man, 
David Borthwick, uh, was killed when he took a rock to the head. Uh, now the two groups, so the Stony Monday Riot, who I was with, and the Bytown Boys Supporters Club uh, are actively different. Uh, they disagree on things like performance practice, social politics, uh, and musical repertoire, and have organized themselves physically in the stadium uh, in such a way that there's actually a space between them uh, that no supporters occupy. Uh, a salient no man's land, representative of the fracture. These empty seats here, so there is one person, not a supporter, separates the groups, the Bytown Boys at the front, Stony Monday Rive in black at the back. <laughs> 50 people, and it's very serious stuff. Uh, here's another shot that might show it a little better from the side. Again, you have a few black shirts at the top, really starting the riot, and uh, the other supporters group uh, down at the bottom. Um, so in that sense, Ottawa's professional football club has two distinct sonic traditions, uh, and they're quarreling. Uh, I should add, though, without physical violence, uh, inside or outside the state. Uh, so I put together a, a bird's eye view uh, of what is called Section W. Um, a small section reserved for rush seating, which is different than anywhere else in the stadium, uh, held exclusively for tickets printed on behalf of the team for the supporters groups to use for themselves and uh, or sell to casual fans. So in this new kind of fringe activity, uh, $10 tickets are quite attractive. Buy $10 tickets from the supporters group. Um, so to explain the diagram, at the Stony Monday Riot at the top, SMR, their foil, the Bytown Boys at the bottom, and no man's land in between. The X's represent different supporters, the circles represent their drums, uh, flag means flag, they wave flags, uh, and Xavier, oh, this is a person, at the bottom there, um, represents the Bytown Boys Kaplan, uh, which is like uh, their conductor. He seems to have some role of, of leadership in the group. Uh, here he is on the cover of the season program guide with the flag tied around his head. Um, he does not actually watch the game, um, but he stands on a raised platform out of bounds uh, and, and tells his group what to sing and when to sing it. Um, so that there, the idea that Xavier and his position exist is representative of the biggest difference between the two groups and with that their sonic practices. Um, you, you can see the Bytown boys actually stand organized almost like a, a traditional choir with a, a semicircle shape facing their conductor. Um, the Stony Monday Riot, on the other hand, uh, have their drums at the center of the organization, kind of non-human objects holding power over their performance. So their first drum, which is Borthwick, you can see a little bit of it down here, uh, was actually named for the guy who was killed in 1849. Uh, it plays like the group's black and red heart, they say. Um, even the way they stand and, and face the field, the Stony Monday Riot have the drums as the center of their group um, as their leader. Uh, and, and how they cued a song or a sound is completely different. So for example, they have one chant that goes, ubi, 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 oi, 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 in a, in a call and response pattern. Um, and at one of the first games I attended as, as a researcher, I decided, oh heck, let's try the supporters thing. Uh, so uh, I jumped in and I, I started a chant, which is how it works. Uh, when you feel it, you just sing, um, or drum, or chant, uh, and then the group joins in. Um, but not everyone always, and sometimes nobody, uh, but the option is there. But if you get the, the timing right and the chant pitched with appropriate enthusiasm, you can get the whole group to join in, uh, even other parts of the stadium sometimes, which feels pretty cool. Um, so it must have been 15 minutes into my second game when the cold wheat soup had me feeling bold. Uh, so I let out in full throat, ooby, 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 and, a, and an arm just shot right across my chest. Um, fan favorite, Sinisa Ubiperovic, is not on the field. Uh, you don't chant Ubi 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 when Ubi is on the bench. Um, I had no idea Ubi was a name, and, uh, and I had no, no idea he was on the bench. But that's how it goes. The, the Bytown boys have a song book, and they actually gather in pubs to practice their, their, their songs. And the Stony Monday Riot in Culturate in the stadium. Um, the Stony Monday Riot have no leader, though they have leaders, so there's a small group dedicated to public outreach, painting signs, taking care of the drums, um, but they have no capital L leader. Um, I actually asked uh, one, one research participant uh, if it might be Borthwick, if their drum perhaps is, is the leader of the group, and I was told no. 
There is no leader, there is no, ca uh, no capital, uh, absolutely fundamental to their way of being, uh, counter-traditional to that of the Baitangos. The groups also have, have different repertoires, where the Stony Monday Riot think it's ridiculous to adapt the melody from Walking in a Winter Wonderland to suit a football match. Uh, and they'll undermine the Bytown boys when they sing Walking in a Fury Wonderland um, by rapping their drums uh, or, or starting a new chant, or, or worst of all, just standing there in silence. This points to some of the overlap that can and does exist between them and, and brings us to the last uh, musical example uh, I wanted to get to, um, but again, I'll have to contextualize a bit first. So while both supporters groups have their unique identities, membership, and, and sonic practices, they do work together, and, and sometimes with the owners and operators of the team, to make for the best football-like environment possible. One interlocutor uh, put it this way. Everybody knows, you want a football market? You want to be considered respectable, within the bounds, supporters culture. They all know that that needs to be there to be considered a legitimate team and a legitimate business. So in the end, both supporters groups and the owners and operators of the team all have the same goal in mind, which is to support and grow the beautiful game in the capital. They just have different ideas about how to do it. Um, for example, to both the Stony Monday Riot and the Bytown Boys, game day and its atmosphere is an outpouring of their passion in support of the team. Um, and that passion belongs to them. Uh, the owners, though, they hear music, and they see the drums, and they think, let's hire a band to play during the games. Or let's bring the drum line from Toronto. It's like the worst thing they can do. Um, <laughs> The, the fans wanted drums and live music. That's what the owners see. So how about a marching band? That makes sense. Um, they believe in the credo that game day is a consumer product. They put it out for you to consume. So one day, they actually brought in a marching band um, who played before and during the game um, and roamed the stadium with their sounds. Um, and at one point, they positioned themselves behind the Stony Monday Riot uh, on the concourse of the stadium and they started to play. Um, the band leader thought, this is a great idea. We'll all team up and it'll be beautiful. Um, so I'll play a clip in just a second. Uh, and what you'll hear is a marching band playing Chicago, the American pop group, uh, their famous song 25 or 6 to 4. Um, but about 12 seconds in, something happens. So um, we'll listen for it. Stony Monday Riots, so that's both the supporters groups, chanting, this is our house, teaming up to go against the marching band, letting them know that this is their house. Um, they actually turned, turned and faced the band, uh, directing all of their energy towards the perceived offender, the imperial power coming to, trying to claim their sonic territory, stripping them of everything that comes from staking their claims and, and taking place as supporters. So Murray Schaefer, again, the Canadian composer, warned us of sound's imperial nature. But I don't think he considered it with human systems he was so critical of. Um, from all parties involved, it's the owners and the two supporters group. What you actually hear is, is, is like a sonic imperialism. They're all fighting for territory and influence within this small, small stadium of football in, in the capital. I think this is absolutely amazing. So what, what can we learn uh, from studying uh, this specific node in a, the global network of, of football sonic fandom? So Eric Hobsbawm, in the uh, seminal text on the invention of tradition, 
defends its examination by pointing out that uh, invented traditions, he says, bear evidence. Uh, but evidence of what? So when I listen to the soundscape and I think back critically, um, I hear a polyphony in the populace uh, and a sounded form of politics that resists game day as a consumer product as best it can while still participating actively in processes of capital. The, the supporters groups uh, have merchandise, they sell tickets, they, they sell scarves. Um, I also hear celebration. Um, I hear people taking off their Ottawa box, you know, sometimes putting on a snowman instead. Uh, I also hear paradox and contradiction. Um, the, support the supporters borrow melodies from popular culture from songs they do not own, uh, just as they claim that the owners and operators are doing to them uh, as they unleash their passions. Cameras capture the fury and new advertisements are made. Uh, in that sense, the supporters are increasing the value of game day by creating this atmosphere, um, but they're okay with it so long as they're uh, as long as their ticket prices uh, do not increase. Um, I hear entangled in the oral dimension um, some, some evidence of what uh, Jocelyn Gilbo calls liberal, rooted, and patriotic cosmopolitan musical bonding. Uh, the sound world here is, is indexic of an openness uh, felt in Ottawa. Kind of a no matter how different you are in the stadium, where you are from, or what music cultures you follow, um, the stadium is open to that difference. Um, it is free to be explored and celebrated. Um, we can see it in the flags, the groups wave as well. Uh, oftentimes you'll see um, the flag of Ireland uh, is, is a common one, I think it was in an earlier picture. Uh, often also the flag of Quebec, which is a, a distinct province in Canada, has kind of a nationalist sentiment, a French nationalist sentiment. Um, and the world is not like this everywhere. Um, so maybe if just for a moment we can kind of celebrate these different identities uh, in the short duration of a football match. Um, this is a concept I'm, I'm really going after uh, right now, um, the idea that cosmopolitan musical bonding. I think it's quite effective for uh, analyzing the sound of sports, at least in Canada. Um, so while we engage in separation and symbolic violence, symbolic, symbolically violent acts, uh, firing songs and chants at each other, uh, from different platforms, uh, taking aim and trajectory into account. It is only that, it's, it's only symbolic. Uh, and because performing this quarrel is tied so strictly to Fury football, it's temporary. Uh, to play it the other way, there are no more stony Monday riots in Ottawa. Um, maybe here for a little bit, you can pretend to be involved in the politics of the 1800s, uh, if only for that same small time span throwing symbolic rocks and firing cannons at each other. Um, and it's fun to play these kind of games, while the one on the field, to my take, moves so slowly. Um, I hear evidence of politics at play in Ottawa today, uh, a politics of staking claims and taking place. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Um, certainly from the Irish context, is it, uh, so, uh, well, I don't know who else, who else is here from Ireland, but um, here are, are the, uh, yeah, of course, um, the League of Ireland yeah. football clubs here would be, have quite a relative small fan base, and lots of Irish people would support clubs internationally, whether predominantly in the Premier League, but also maybe Italy, Spain, maybe Germany to a far lesser extent. Um, I, su I support a British club since I was a boy, since I was, you know, whatever, nine, ten, younger. But I also... In Limerick, I support my local League of Ireland club, and I bring my kids to see Limerick play football, and we get a gate, an average gate of maybe 1,500 people. Um, but I sit in front of the ultras, <laughs> okay, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like 60, 70, 80 guys, mm -hmm. right, predominantly, and maybe one or two women in there. Um, and, but I bring my kids there to experience football life, and to sing those songs, and to, to, you know, to get that the real lived element is watching football. They play football and then you go to go see football as well. Um, so this really resonates with me. And, awesome. and the, the, the corporate element, um, you know, we see it in games in one of the papers earlier on where, you know, prices of tickets in, in Premier League matches, people walking out of stadia to, to protest and so forth, which was maybe a more vastly pronounced version of something that happens here. Mm -hmm. So I, I really enjoy that. So questions, please, anyone? Um, awesome. Go ahead. Let's go. <laughs> 
I would like to ask about um, the structure of football clubs in, uh, in Canada because uh, I don't know it is similar like in, in the United States where, where the, for example many clubs not only soccer uh, have some franchise uh, nature and uh, in, in my opinion this uh, this situation can cause some problem with identity mm. because if the group a few years exist in city and next is re relocated how it is uh, about uh, Canada case and uh, my, my second uh, question is because you you consider two groups one of the groups has uh, in a logo the, the very old date yes. and it is uh, it, it is my question about some rules and if these two groups fight uh, about some authenticity issue like my our group is more real and uh, authentic uh, th than you. Okay, uh, the yeah. first the first question, so these are franchises. Mm -hmm. um, this, the Ottawa's club, uh, was founded in 2011, didn't play a game for three years, but was selling kits, selling, selling merchandise, trying to get everyone uh, riled up. Um, they played at that time in what's called the North American Soccer League. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the United States, but they have Major League Soccer mm -hmm. is the, uh, the highest league. Uh, that would be one league below this. Um, since I've stopped, uh, well, I haven't been to that, that field site in, in, a, in over a year now, um, they've actually gone down another league. So now they're part of the United Soccer League, which, uh, which is, they all play like the Toronto Football Club's B squad or uh, teams uh, like um, like the development clubs, like the other major teams. Uh, because I, I'm not too familiar with Major League Soccer, and I don't know if clubs so much move, uh, because there's not, they'll just pull. So like there has been soccer leagues that kind of pop up in a bubble five years later, boom, gone again, pop up. But it's not like one club goes from Ottawa to say Montreal and reestablishes themselves there. Um, I don't think there is enough, um, there's enough money to make anything like that worthwhile. Just hold the club and start another one. Uh, this, this happens in our other sports, and you know, hockey, football, or American football, Canadian football. They actually do move, um, but uh, this club, I, I know nothing of that in their history. Um, regarding the, uh, the old the canon, 1849 and whatnot, one of the big things that came out of my research um, was that part of being uh, a supporter I'm not 100% familiar with this culture. I, I'm studying it, it's kind of new to me. But part of it is tying yourself to there. You need to be from here. Uh, and one of, the, one of the answers that actually came out uh, with a lot of the supporters was that none of them are actually from Ottawa. Ottawa is a city, you grow up there and you leave. Uh, often you're there because of school or government. So while they're claiming to be you know, part of this riot from 1849, tying themselves to an old like, political, you know, pre-Canada politics, um, none of them actually have any ties to it, uh, any ties to the city. So while they both claim, like um, they both claim to be, you know, authentically from here, branding themselves as our house, right? This is ours. We own it. Um, none of them actually are are, are from there. Um, the Bytown Boys. So Bytown was uh, the name of Ottawa before it became Canada's capital. Uh, in its early days, as like a logging city. Uh, they have roots uh, in that to what used to be called the Shiners, which were um, uh, laborers uh, from, from Ireland brought in uh, to help with the, the logging and, and lumber industry in early Ottawa. Uh, the Stony Monday Ride, on the other hand, tie themselves to what would have been you know, British politics in what would have been like Upper Canada at the time. Um, their fights are, again, I feel like they're not physical. I've never seen any instances of, of anything even close to violence. Once there was somebody threw a, a can of cider at a player on a, on a visiting team and was banned from the stadium for a year. So it, it was so lit, like it was almost a nothing, but they really cracked down hard. They do not want this to turn into violent sectarianism you know, that comes about. Um, but there, there, a lot of their um, conflict is played out online in message boards where they just talk so much bad stuff about each other. Um, but like they would never, never make it known in the stadium. They'll, they have nicknames for like recognizable figures in the other groups. Uh, they don't even, they don't even talk to each other. 
it's, it's odd. There's maybe one or two supporters who will like cross over to no man's land and give a few like what's ups. Um, but, but that's about it. It's, they're, very, they're very different groups. Um, you have to pay to be a member of the Bytown Boys. The Stony Monday Riots say everyone is a supporter. Um, the Bytown Boys have a code of conduct. You can get kicked out of the group if, if you don't represent yourselves in society in a, in a specific way. Um, but it's just, they take it, it for, for something that is very like subcultural. They take it very seriously to be a member in this scene. Um, yeah, I hope that, that answers some of your, some of your questions. Uh, yes, yes. I have uh, uh, a few nights, but... Yeah, maybe we'll move. Uh, please. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. It was a really, really interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, may I ask a question? Maybe